Good evening. Welcome to the February 12th Village Board meeting. This meeting is now called to order. We'll begin with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There you go. Found it. Found the broken one. Oh. oh. We can swap that out. <laughs> okay. Well, good evening. We actually um, apologize for getting started a little late on our televised portion. If you're at home watching live, um, we started with an executive session related to collective bargaining at 6.30. Thank you to all of the um, uh, staff and uh, folks who are helping us through that very important process. And uh, I think we have not too many announcements. Were there? Any, I did not hear any trustee announcements. Then I just will... Um, remind folks or tell folks about this month's documentary and discussion series screening. It is called um, The Trials of Constance Baker Motley. It's a short film about an incredibly important woman in our history that you may not know. And I was so ashamed that I did not know about all of her contributions. Um, it's February. It's Black History Month. She was the first African-American woman who was elected to the New York State Senate. But what she's actually best known for is her work as a civil rights leader and as a justice. So um, please do join us next Thursday, February 20th. Um, at uh, Sing Sing Kill Brewery, special location with this short film, and we'll have a very special panel. It is the um, director and producer of the film, Rick Rogers, who is from Ossining, and um, Joel Motley, who is the producer, who is, um, that is, uh, his name is not a coincidence, he is the son of Constance Baker Motley. So, um, we hope that you can join us. It's at a special time. It doesn't start till 7 o'clock, which makes it a little easier for folks getting off the train to join us um, down on Spring Street at Sing Sing Kill Brewery, which is across the street from the courthouse. Um, I feel like there are other things on the calendar, but if there's something super important, we'll mention it when it comes, uh, comes around again. Madam manager would you like to introduce our first guests I I would thank you very much um, so as you know we have been working on gearing up for our comprehensive plan update and this is a process that the village started um, this past summer and after um, doing our due diligence with with an RFP and looking uh, through some very good candidates, the steering committee unanimously decided to recommend that we um, go forward with comprehensive planning with uh, BFJ planning. So tonight, I'd like to introduce uh, Frank Fish, principal, and Simon Cates from BFJ to discuss their proposal. And we will be asking the board to um, consider a resolution so that we can go forward and uh, start the planning process. We're very excited. Um, a lot of work went into this on behalf of the um, uh, um, the steering committee, and I do want to recognize that um, not only the mayor, but trustees Lopez and Casada have been involved in this discussion at all, and both uh, trustees Lopez and Casada serve on the steering committee too, so I don't know if they have anything to add to that up. I would just add that it was uh, certainly a competitive and thoughtful process that we went through. We wanted to make sure that all of the village concerns that have been coming up over the last few years, from parking to schools, housing to the environment, all were uh, within the wheelhouse of whatever planner we chose. And uh, we made sure to ask a lot of questions about how to be thoughtful around community engagement um, and uh, thinking about what kind of form uh, and function this comprehensive plan can serve. And we're really excited with what they had to say. You want to add to that? We'll just ask questions. No, I'm actually really excited that uh, we're going to be working with them going forward. Um, if this will of the board, obviously. Um, I'm very excited of what their resume and what they have done in other municipalities within Westchester and other parts of um, the area here, the tri-state part. Um, and um, yeah, I just wanted to actually thank uh, Omar and Victoria because they did a lot of the background uh, work last year and put all that stuff together. It just kind of came in the last few months or the beginning of this year. So I'm just, you know, I, I didn't do that much. I had a few questions, um, you know, it was a very good, great process. So, but I want to thank the mayor and Omar for for the work that you guys have done in the past year. So, 
there there are also um some really really strong engaged committee members yes. who are contributing and um, obviously Karen has been and helped guide help guiding through this entire process so uh, yeah we're fortunate to have some some excellent people in-house who are helping um, move it forward and uh, I'm so excited to hear from our guests this evening do you need a screen or anything? so yeah. welcome But what we might do, I don't want to be repetitive of the, the interview, but, um, and I think you may have gotten this. I'm not sure, Karen, uh, um, you asked me to send you the uh, yes, presentation. So, um, no, because oh, I, okay. I don't know if I distributed it yeah. as timely as I should have. So, um, But anyway, there, here's some yeah. hard copies, uh, hard copies of it. Um, uh, is there anything different between those hard copies and what I, I received in the PDF format? Um, I, well, we don't have I thought, uh, that the PDF was at? a was the actual proposal. This is a, a slide version of that, so it's a little bit more okay. concise. This is a subset yes. of what I'm yeah. looking at. Uh, okay. And Simon, here's an option. Yeah. We can share. Oh, perfect. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I, I thought what, what I might do is just maybe highlight it. I don't want to highlight the commercial parts very much because uh, uh, I, I think that those that part has been vetted. The reason I know that, I was, I was in the little village of Bronxville, down county Monday night, and here was the county there discussing the census. And, he's, and Bill said to me, oh, by the way, Frank, I, I got uh, calls from Ossining to make sure that you were you know, a good firm to hire. So <laughs> they uh, they indicated you did your due diligence, I think. But at any rate, this is just, it's a little bit of a, we went through a firm profile on us. We're, uh, BFJ Planning is a firm of about uh, 18 people. And uh, we do a lot of work here in Westchester. We've done a, a number of uh, plans. Uh, Mayor uh, had a chance to talk to you about very briefly uh, Sleepy Hollow, which we just uh, finished. Simon was uh, project manager on Sleepy Hollow, and um, it's been adopted now earlier this year. And uh, Simon would be the uh, project manager here. And um, and and as as uh, you know, uh, we have some Spanish speakers on our staff. So at the interview, um, we're, we're sort of back and forth a little bit on that. We have that capability, and are working in other communities like Mount Kisco. Um, and Peekskill, um, and doing a lot of work right now in Peekskill. We've worked there for a number of years. So I think we're, we've been working in some communities that have some uh, diversity, as, as you do, um, and we've enjoyed very much um, uh, that work. Um, quite frankly, we're back in Mount Kisco now. We did their plan, then the zoning code, and then we did the RFP for them to the development community. And, we got a call from them recently. Okay, we've chosen a developer at the train station. We want you to now bring it through the approvals process. And I said, wait a minute, is that okay with everybody? And they said, yes, legal counsel signed off. There's no conflicts, Frank, and go ahead and do it. So we're very happy with some of those, you know, those experiences. And uh, Simon is also working in Pink Skill now. We're just finishing. That was a question. How available would we be? We have an absolute deadline from the governor's office in March to finish the DRI, the, the Downtown Revitalization Initiative. We're familiar. And you're very familiar. I, I shouldn't. You bring it up a lot. It's I shouldn't. I, sh I caught myself. Yeah, I know. I caught myself <laughs> there. I realized that you know, there's a lot of communities that like to get $10 million to spend. And, and so, but we're just finishing that. So we will be available and, and all our key staff as of Mar as I mentioned in the interview as of March. So, which seems almost now around the corner. So, it's um, so that's a little bit on us, um, the team organization. I, uh, which is on the next page, is a few photographs here. Um, I will act as principal, but Simon will be the project manager. We have a couple of designers. Uh, you had asked about form-based zoning. We do do that uh, quite a bit. We also have um, uh, uh, Christine came to the interview. Spanish-speaking people or bilingual people on the staff. We also have, I, I didn't show it here, but as I, she could not make the interview, but we have a affiliate firm, small firm, uh, three people that do social economic and market analysis. Sort of, uh, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, I was reading through Kevin Dworka's uh, uh, 
studies for you, material. And um, the affiliate firm we have is the WBE, a woman business enterprise, and they do they do similar work to, to Kevin. I was glad to see this work that's been done by, by Kevin. So um, we have that capability, economic capability, and that is urbanomics. Um, at the bottom of page five, I think it's page five here, um, we also have, we just proposed, I got a call because of the work we've done in the past with Kellard Sessions in places like North Castle. Um, we talked to them and we said, why would we bring on an engineer when we, we have worked with Kellard Sessions for 20 years? And so they, they Joe Smelly would be, and any issues on water and sewer, um, we thought we might as well work with the village engineers. I'm very familiar with that. So. Yeah. So, um, and then Derek Edson, just so you know, uh, you had in the RFP form based zoning. So, um, we've worked with uh, a man named Mark Evans, whose uh, photograph is here. In uh, first in Hempstead, New York, but and then in New Rochelle, we did the New Rochelle overlay zones and the, and the with with Mark, uh, the form based zoning, and then we we brought that experience to Mount Kisco. So uh, that's why he's he's here. And and then I, I the project experience, which is the next page, is just to just show a map of Westchester and <laughs> sort of different uh, municipalities. We have worked throughout uh, Westchester. I've uh, I guess I moved here in 1984, so I've been, I'm dating myself a bit, but um, so we've worked a lot here in many uh, different places. And uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, I had a chance to work on the, uh, this is page seven. The, uh, I took it out of a file where I've saved one copy of each report we did. And this was the, uh, the uh, urban cultural park management plan for Austin in 1985. It was, a, it was a, a, a series of plans that the state had uh, different consultants do for them around the state of New York. We ended up doing one for New York City, and we, we ended up doing one here in Ossining and then one up in Troy. And I still remember the Ossining one because I went to see, by the way, to see if the uh, exhibit tree was there, and, you know, and, and I realize it is next to the community center. You've got the exhibit on the... Uh, Croton Aqueduct and Sing Sing, and so I went all through it again just for nostalgia. But um, it's uh, we worked on that, and that was our beginning in Austin. We've worked on some other uh, projects here over, over the years, so um, it's nice to be back, if you will. Uh, and then um, I've mentioned already Mount Kisco, which is the next page, and then Sleepy Hollow. Uh, Simon again has been involved in both of those, as well as Peak Skill. Uh, the next page, um, Derek Edson, I think on page 11, I've just covered a little bit. Um, we just feel they're very good uh, code coding people, form-based coding uh, people if we do get into that downtown. I, I realize that there's more of an issue here perhaps on the T-zone and some other issues. So um, we're very happy to be involved there. And if I could, maybe I don't want to take you know, too much of your time, but let me turn this to Simon a little bit on the timeline, which is um, really page 12. And um, I wanted to emphasize here too, well, Simon will get to this, that we're very flexible about when we start uh, the seeker process. When you do a plan and zoning, then you have to make some decisions on seeker. And as we get into this, we're, we're more than happy to talk to you about that. Uh, thank you, Frank. Um, I'll, I'll be brief here, and, and I'll, I'll sort of talk through the timeline in, in, in big picture terms, especially because folks at home um, can't see what we're, lo we're looking at here. But um, from, a, from, a, from a big picture standpoint, uh, I think what we want to emphasize, I'm um, thinking about, about the timeline, is, is um, it's number one, it's great that you all have already gotten a start. Um, you've done some work, you've done some meetings um, over the summer, so we've got work to build off of in addition to your prior plan and other planning studies you've done in the past um, 10 years or so. Um, but also the fact that you've got an engaged uh, uh, comprehensive plan review committee. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an important partner for us to have a liaison into the community um, that we can work with and make sure that we've got, um, we've got a close connection um, um, when, when, we, when we come to the village and, and we've got someone who can help us um, identify the key issues, um, help us with outreach, right? We'll, we'll, do, uh, we'll do robust public outreach, but we need, uh, we need a partner in that. And so, uh, and so we're, we're, we're very happy to see that 
um, that, that 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 group has set up, and we and we met uh, we met them when we came to the interview. Um, the other big picture point I want to make on the timeline is that when we're working on sections of the plan uh, deliverables that we're putting together, it's an iter iter an iterative process, um, right? We've got um, a, a series of public workshops, um, a public survey, uh, meetings with uh, with stakeholders, um, um, focus group meetings, and that sort of thing. Uh, meetings with uh, the, the Comprehensive Plan Review Committee, and of course, briefings with the Village Board throughout the process. And that all makes sure that, um, that um, you know, we'll, we have a workshop, we go back and we do some work and we put together some early, early stages of the plan. Um, we come back to the community, we get more information, make sure that we're on the right track, um, do a little bit more work um, throughout the process, right? So we're not, we're not working in isolation. We need input from the community, from from the committee, and and of course from the village board to make sure that we're not uh, going off uh, going off in the wrong direction. Uh, and so that's really the, uh, the the big picture points on 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 the timeline. The other thing, as Frank alluded to, and we and we had a nice discussion about this at at the interview, is that what we what we proposed were were two options um, of of how the timeline could could unfold, how the how the process could unfold, and it depends on whether. Uh, the, the, the plan results in um, uh, an environmental assessment form and a negative declaration uh, of, of uh, adverse impacts on the environment uh, or a positive declaration of adverse impacts on the environment and an environmental impact statement. And um, with, a, with, a, with a neg deck, with a, with a sort of plan that we don't think is going to have um, adverse impacts, we can do this in a tight time frame. If it requires an EIS, then then we need to figure out what the what the extended time frame is. Um, the RFP asked for uh, a time frame of 12 months. Um, if we're going to do an EIS, right? If there's going to be a, a, a zoning change that that you all want us to look at more closely um, to to evaluate those impacts, it extends the timeline out. And and the degree to which it extends that timeline out is really up for um, discussion. And we've got flexibility uh, on that, as as, as Frank said. Um, some of the discussion that we started to have at the interview is about um, how early do we need to know that we collectively in the process um, if if we're going to if we're going to go toward uh, an EIS and an environmental impact statement and the answer is really it's up it's up to how the process unfolds the earlier we know the more that we can overlap um, if we need more time right collectively if we need more time to to arrive on that um, then that then that's fine too so um, I think that that's the other the other message on on the timeline. Um, with that, I don't know. I think we can maybe go to Q and A, or is there anything else in the no, proposal that you want to? Yeah, yeah. We can, we can pretty yeah. much turn it back back to you. I, I usually go last, but I just want to make sure I understand something. Sure. Um, you're talking about I, I, talking about the EIS if it ends up being required, which is if there's um, if there's a positive declaration that the the plan as it's uh, be, been conceived is going to have a, an impact. Um, of concern on the environment. Um, it described two parts. Describe to me uh, what sorts of, is that typical, and what sorts of elements of a plan would trigger that? And um, what is, I think it's probably another level where we're talking about, like, if there's an overlay zone and we create a GEIS. If, you know, if we wanted to do our whole commercial zone from Croton Avenue down Main Street to the waterfront, and we wanted to create a GEIS and form-based codes, I assume that's even another level of uh, process and time. Yeah, so the, um, the, the short answer is that it depends. Uh, so, for example, in, in New Rochelle and in Mount Kisco, mm -hmm. we expected from, and the, and the municipalities expected from the outset, this is going to, we're making major recommendations in terms of zoning changes. Um, we know going in, we're going to do an EIS, and that was that was part of what we all understood at the outset. Um, other communities that we've worked with, um, Sleepy Hollow, um, Village of Nyack, um, uh, the the you know there weren't major changes like that anticipated, and so um, the process unfolded more toward the direction of um, look, the, the, this these plans are about um, protecting the environment; they're not about making major development changes. And so the result was um, was a negative declaration. The plan was beneficial to the environment, not um, uh, didn't have adverse adverse impacts. So different plans with different uh, different objectives uh, might might take a different uh, take a different course. A plan that requires an EIS doesn't mean that it's a bad thing that it's doing bad things for the environment. It means that there may be recommendations that you want to take a closer look at, 
and understand what the impacts are and if and, and if there's any mitigation um, necessary. So if you want to add to that, Rick. So it's really, we've done it, a major message is we've done it both ways in Westchester. Right now, we have a meeting Friday morning in Yonkers to discuss the environmental impact statement of, of uh, which we're underway with uh, for the Ludlow train area. We've done a, done a whole plan and zoning. And uh, it's just uh, Martin Ginsburg, who may yep. be familiar with, <laughs> you know, is, you know, proposing um, two, two buildings that will pierce the existing zoning envelope. So it, it is, it is uh, in, in Yonkers view, although they're very familiar with Martin, he does, and he's done in Yonkers, uh, they feel very good work. Um, it has some impacts and they want to do, they want to do, we're doing both a generic environmental impact statement and site specific to uh, the Ginsburg project because we have the data and the designs on it. So that's one example, but Monday night I, I was in the village of Bronxville and um, we just did their plan and I knew enough not to really ask them or even give them a choice because I knew their answer and that is they would never do the mayor has always, the mayor's got she's been there a while and uh, she once said to me Bronxville would never adopt a plan that had a single negative environmental impact she said we believe that our plans are beneficial and therefore we will do a neg deck in fact they didn't even wait they just did the neg deck as seeker provides you can make that determination of significance as early in the process as you like and Bronxville just made it uh, made it up front. She was right because the Bronxville plan is basically a preservation plan. So, and the county agreed right away. So here, I think this is much more complicated. Uh, you've got some major things underway, and this could, you know, I don't want to, I, I, I don't like in the first meeting or, you know, to be predictive, other than to say we're very comfortable either way. We, we did an EIS in Mount Kisco. New Rochelle, as Simon said, New Rochelle, we knew going in. It was going to be an EIS. So, but having to do an EIS, you mentioned um, T zones, and if that was more important versus the form based codes, I wouldn't necessarily say it's more important. I think it's, it's, a, it's one of the, they're, they're both, they're, both they're different, um, different, but they, they, yeah. they both uh, prove to be important components of the, uh, the update. Um, but if, if we were to change um, two family zone to multifamily zone, I assume that that's, something that might trigger an EIS. That could have and, impacts. But it might make a lot of sense for us. We couldn't be more different than Bronxville. You couldn't, right. you couldn't be more different, different That's than right. Westchester. That's right. Um, okay. I'm sure my colleagues have. Yeah. <laughs> I already asked all my questions. I'm, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm really <laughs> not <laughs> sure what else to ask. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and that was a big part of the discussion that we had, you know, where and the timeline, what that means. And, you know, yeah. um, where, where we are, there's one thing there, man. I'm glad you raised that because there's one thing which I, I kind of call a, uh, or I did in New Rochelle anyway, for us, if it's possible, and you know at some point in the process, we're going to do an EIS, that if we can line it up, and we, we've sort of shown an example here in maybe month 13 or so, if we can line up what I call it, uh, to use a colloquial, a trifecta, and that is you can do a public hearing on the draft plan the draft zoning and the DEIS at the same time, then that is one way to, you know, your RFP said, let's try to do something in a year. And it is possible. It's not easy. The, the um, quickest we've done an EIS with a plan is in fact New Rochelle, where it became very clear to us at the beginning that you had a, uh, a master developer, RxR, so not a, you know, somebody fairly organized. You had a mayor and you had a council that was completely to the person dedicated to meet, meeting every single sinker deadline. And I have never seen this, uh, in other words, it's in your control. They met every single one uh, of the deadlines allowed by sinker and everyone was on board. So we did it in eight months, the downtown plan, zoning, and the EIS. But that's very hard to do, very hard to do, but it's possible. So we think it, it, it you know, the year time frame 
we just wanted to say we're flexible. Um, it definitely can be done on the basis of an EAF. It's, if it's an EIS, it, it usually takes a little longer and we're comfortable with it either way. So I think here you are definitely, as, as the mayor said, uh, different than Bronxville. So more complicated, uh, more development proposals, I think, from what I, I understand so far, the more issues like the T-zone. If, if there's an increase in density, um, that has to be <clears throat> that has to be looked at. You might want to look at. I, I've asked my big questions. I want to hear other people's <laughs> questions, and then we can uh, make informed decisions. I don't have any questions at this point. I know Rick has questions. <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of questions, but I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. I see a 16 month, right? So each of the numbers up there are 16. I just, um, you know, you blocked in on the chart, you know, workshop one, workshop two, town hall. I guess it's in Spanish. I'm not sure when the town hall is, if it's Spanish and English, or you do two separate ones. But it's just a public engagement park part that, I mean, I'm looking at a relatively generic chart here. So, it's not an ostening chart. It's something that you plugged in a bunch of stuff based on your experience. Um, so it's hard for me to look at this. I, I don't know, like, if there are subcommittees, like, where that fits in. So I'm just sort of, I think this is more of who you are. Sorry, I have to speak to the mic. Who you are type of stuff, which I'm sure the steering committee looked at. Um, that's all good. I, I, I'm the thing about this village, and I've not been an elected official anywhere else. I work elsewhere, but um, in Westchester, all the municipalities are a little bit different. You know, the communication to the public, um, two-way communication plus engagement, which is different than communication, isn't jumping off the page for me. And if there are going to be subcommittees not jumping off, all I keep seeing is the word zoning, zoning, because it's one of the phases, actually, is all about zoning. So when I first heard about comprehensive plans, I did not walk away from any of those meetings thinking that it's all zoning. I mean, as just a person who's never done it. As I see more and more, all I see is zoning, um, not only in your documents. So it's not a question. I sort of just... Um, not quite sure even what to ask because there's nothing for me to really so, so look at except to trust so, that the work was done. So maybe it would be a good idea. One thing I want to say is that public engagement, um, there is a public engagement plan that will will supplement the public engagement, um, the, the workshops and, and the public meetings here that was put together by PACE that the steering committee uh, worked on. And um, so maybe you can talk about the what I think a lot of the steering committee and the committee wants to uh, know is the, the whole visioning element and the visioning process and how we have the many touch points for working with subcommittees and, and crafting the, the vision of or, or updating well, our vision. To talk about that, but let me just mention that we, we also do have a, a bit of experience. We've worked with PACE uh, Outreach in New Rochelle uh, on the, both downtown plan and the citywide plan we did with PACE. There was a sort of joint uh, effort there. So I just wanted to mention that briefly. I'll let Simon go ahead. So uh, th those are all really great um, concerns to have raised. And so I want to sort of talk through a couple of different, uh, a couple of different points there. So number one, um, the, the timeline, yes, it's in part based on our experience. Um, it's also based on, on the RFP and, and, and responding to, uh, uh, to issues in there. So it is, it is tailored. Um, but the other thing is that if we get into the process and, um, you know, we have a kickoff meeting um, with village staff, with, uh, with the review committee, and there's something that we missed or there's something new that comes up, uh, again, we're, we're flexible, right? Um, so um, if, if, the, if the, you know, if there's something that, uh, that's not quite there, then, then, then that's something we would, we would want to talk about. Um, the other thing on sort of generally what a comprehensive plan is, um, Yes, it might have some zoning. The reason zoning, you know, jumps off of the page uh, on the timeline is because that was one of the uh, items in the scope of work in the RFP. But a comprehensive plan is much more than that. 
Um, it's it's uh, economic development. It's transportation. It's housing. Um, uh, it's uh, it's parks and open space. It's um, sustainability and resilience to climate change. Um, there are there may be other priorities that that we get into as as we start to talk about it. Um, it is not just something, um, right? That might be one 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 component of it, but um, we know that there are many other issues. A lot of these issues uh, begin to overlap, uh, and so that's one one wow. way that we think about uh, issues that we get into in in a comprehensive plan. And the third thing on 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 community engagement and visioning, we've got a couple of uh, slides on that, starting on on page twenty, uh, it's page twenty and twenty one, um, that that get into um, some of the uh, strategies and tools that that we tend to use. Um, but once again, um, every community is different, right? And so the the there might be um, outreach methods that um, that you all have developed in Austin that work here um, that we haven't talked about. And we're certainly not averse to, to working with you on that. In fact, we need that type of uh, a type of input from the review committee and, and from the village in order to make sure that we're um, we're doing the right we're doing the right things. I'll give you one example uh, like that. We worked uh, in um, not to bring up DRI again. We worked in uh, the village of Watkins Glen a couple of years ago uh, up in the southern tier, and it's a village of I think about 1,900 people. And we were working with them. We were, were downstate, so we were, had we had to you know drive all the way up there. We're not in we're not in the village up there, um, and so we worked with um, folks in the community to figure out what is the best way to get the word out. And and there they used a method that we never used before, which is that everyone gets their electric bill in the mail, and we were able to put a little blurb on the electric bill about our upcoming public workshops. And so everyone in the village got a, a, basically, from our standpoint, a free mailing that was advertising our public workshops. And in a village of 1,900 people, we got uh, routinely upwards of 150 people at public workshops. In New Rochelle, we would get about 80, right? A city of 80,000 people, right? So, so little things like that um, that we wouldn't have known about if it wasn't from if it wasn't for talking to uh, to, to people on the ground, um, you know, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have gotten the turnout that, that we did. So. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but um, but we have some ideas here, right? We we, we do public workshops. Um, we have smaller meetings, focus group uh, or stakeholder interviews that could be with um, uh, uh, property owners, with environmental groups, with arts and cultural groups. Um, right? There might be others. Um, we do public surveys. When we do a public survey, um, we we administer it online. We also have hard co hard copies. We do them in English and in Spanish. Um, Pop-up meetings are a way for us to um, usually at the beginning of a process when we're doing visioning, um, uh, you know, set up a booth at a farmer's market, somewhere where people are already going, right? So that we can start to talk to people who might not hear about the process otherwise, might not have time on a, on a weeknight to come to a, a public workshop. So um, we try to figure out ways within a community that we can, um, you know, we can find locally specific uh, strategies for, for public outreach. Um, on, on specifically when we're thinking about visioning, um, you've done some of that already. So we want to we want to talk to Pace. We want to talk to people who were at uh, the, the meetings over the summer and see what came out of those and 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 what information has already been gathered that we don't have to repeat, um, so that we know uh, we know what what the starting point is. Um, but um, but the reason we do visioning it be, is because we can't come in to Austin and tell you all um, here's what here's what the plan here's what your priorities are. Here's what your plan should be about. We need to hear that from from the community. So, um, so that's why we we want to work with the, the review committee to make sure that the the community outreach that we do is is locally specific. Thank you, Simon. Um, my first question is around marketing. I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are about how to market the comprehensive plan in a compelling way to the community. Do you mean in terms of a, a sort of a branding and, and sort of a sort of having a comprehensive graphic and design around it? Yeah, um, we've done a bit of that, and, and that's something that we can um, we can start with with um, the committee and, and talk about what are what are some of the um, sort of key priorities that we want to hit on. Um, we found we don't want to spend too much time doing that because then you get into the process and people people don't know what the you know what that brand is. Um, so it's important to hit the ground running and, 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 and you know, at, at the very, very beginning, right, first month, um, figure out what that is, but develop, you know, from our end, from e-blasts that we put out or from flyers that we put out, if there's a, 
a, a simple, compelling, um, recognizable graphic right, or, or sort of visual language so that so that when someone sees an email or, or a flyer at the library, um, they recognize throughout the, the year, year and a half what, what that is. Right. Mm -hmm. Or as outsiders, we're always outsiders wherever we are, except for you know, we live here in Westchester. But the um, uh, my impression is you're going to have an easier time than some communities we worked with. Uh, you, you, there's a certain image, I think. Uh, you have things like, uh, you know, I don't want to just say the obvious, but you know, having worked on the urban cultural park, you have the Crotonac, you have things here. And that people know about, and but also you have an identifiable center. We worked in Rye Brook. Rye Brook. Anybody know where the center of Rye Brook is? I mean, it, it, it's it's I, I you know, most people don't. I mean, it had an image. It still does. It's not an easy thing to solve in some areas. I think a branding could be uh, a, a some, somewhat of a uh, manageable thing here. It's just working with you on that brand. We do have uh, a, an affiliate group in our offices who does, um, they don't do just this type of, you know, brand for a comprehensive plan, but they do do uh, other types of uh, brand uh, sort of images, including for uh, annual reports, corporations, they're, they're very good at it. And so we have access to them if that comes up. My concern is that 2020 is a year where there's a lot going on. There's a presidential election, there's the census, there's a lot. And so when there are so many messages coming toward people, there's a unified visual vocabulary for what this process is that will span a long period of time. So you have to sustain people's attention for that long, that branding could be helpful. Very, and one, you've raised a very important thing, too. There's also something we learned. Uh, the mayor of Mount Kisco said to, this to me. She said, you know, Frank, after a while, there's also something called planning fatigue. She said, let's not have another workshop. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just, we had five. And uh, we had Saturday workshops. We had charrettes, design charrettes, and so on. And it worked out fine. And, and they were very pleased. But at the end, she was saying, hey, let's not have another because it, you get dwindling effects. You got to know when to also package it, if you will, in a, in a product. So. Yeah. My next question is about audiences. So there are the folks that are on the uh, steering committee. There's the public. There's the village uh, in terms of employees and so forth. But I'm curious to hear about how planning and zoning boards and other kind of adv advisory boards might come into play uh, with the comprehensive plan. I want to say that right now I feel we're before the board that is the absolute critical board. The comprehensive plan in this state uh, can only be adopted by yourself. And of course, zoning can only be adopted. That wasn't always true uh, until 19, the mid-1990s. The planning board used to adopt the comprehensive plan. And uh, someone from this, this um, county changed that. His name was George Raymond. He argued heavily in the legislature in Albany that uh, plans, too many plans were ended up on the shelf because the elected officials had not bought into them. He won the argument. And so you are the most important board. Only you can adopt the plan. Only you can adopt zoning. You have to be the lead agency for the seeker process. So if we do an EIS, you are the lead agency. All other boards have to are, are by definition, therefore, uh, involved agencies or you know advisory to you we usually find in a plan because state law refers to them the planning board is supposed to be sent the plan for their advice and not consent their advice <laughs> and uh, you are the board that is central but having said that the we usually find the planning board and then other boards that you may feel important to you we would meet with or, or, or brief or have involved. And I think the committee, it, it's good to always invite those boards to committee meetings. And, and what we would like to do, though, I, I don't know if I've said this before, Karen, but is to brief, make sure that, and, and I'm glad uh, two of you are on our committee, right? Uh, so you're trustees. So you would keep the board 
uh, informed of what's going on. But it, to me, it's very critical that the, the trustees, you the trustees, are, are fully informed. I'll never forget <laughs> one experience I had in the black dirt area of Orange County. We met with a committee in, in, in Warwick. And I met for a year with the committee. I was a young planner. I wasn't uh, that experienced. And, um, and then the committee said, I guess we're done. What do we do? I said, well, you know, the town board has to adopt this. And when I walked into the town board, I knew I had made a mistake. There was not a single member of the committee there. No one, you know, you're, two of you are on the committee. So you're, we're going to avoid that here. But I, I really want to say that you are the key. You are the key. Thank you. More questions for our guests. Then questions for staff on uh, next steps. I assume the, uh, if the board is supportive of moving forward with uh, contracting with DFJ to be the consultant to guide us through this process, then we would have a resolution on the next legislative session uh, ask directing the manager to sign the contract. That's correct. Are we all comfortable with moving it to that stage? You have a question. Right? No, no, yeah, yes, <laughs> and, and, and I do. So I please remind us what is the amount of the contract. Um, and I have a question for them in regards to time. And I know you say March, but I have something in addition to that. So, so um, the, the, there are two scenarios. So if there's a neg deck and, and no, um, we don't go forward with the EIS, the uh, contracted amount is $244,142. Um, and if we do uh, determine that we are going to go forward with a positive declaration, the um, cost is $298,907. Our budget for this project is um, $300,000. So, so and, and again, that was part of the conversation we had that day in Stuart, please stop me if I'm going to, I'm going to defer that question to exec because it, there's, a, there's some details that I want to double check, make sure that I, I don't want it misspoke on, in regards to this. Understood. So, um, but, uh, we go to exec and we, oh, I guess we could still do it in exec. Okay. Yes. So uh, I would like to ask a motion to go on executive session for. Right now, for a moment. Yes, for because I would like to agree to the contract, but I want to make sure that I'm agreeing to one or two or both uh, at some point of time because I think it's critical for us to understand that. And we don't have to agree, we don't have to go there right now, but we can do it. I would like to speak at some point today to have an agreement on the contract portion. Can, can I? Yeah. Can I just make sure that I understand what's being asked? So um, I, I know which of these I want. But I just um, I, I just go with B, and we can stop talking about it. But but what I want to what I but what, how is that when and how is that determination made? Is it is that another recommendation so, that will come out of the so process? So we would so so if you look at as you do like a, a big contract with an ad alternate, if you decide that the contract would would be based um, on um, essentially the contract would would define the fact that if if there's a neg deck. The cost will be two hundred and forty-four thousand dollars. That could be a close within that. Oh yeah, okay. no, that, then, those then are okay the two options. That. So yeah, I know, you fine. know, and that can be delineated in the contract. So it's very clear that once you trigger the decision to go forward, then the contract amount is. But both are set contracted amounts. Yeah. But uh, uh, help me just understand the um, the implications here, because in my mind. If we want to consider going forward with having a GEIS for the commercial corridor and having the potential for form-based codes in the commercial corridor, then we have to go with option B, which is the positive declaration and the draft generic environmental impact statement, correct? And if that's the case, do we, don't we, I was just looking for the, the timeline, when does that decision have to be made? I don't wanna, I don't wanna dither around if that's where we're gonna end up going and we just wasted a bunch of time wondering yeah, by the way, on, on the first one, the form-based, um, form-based um, zoning really just says we're, we're describing, if you will, the design of the building. And so that alone, that alone might not require an EIS. Okay. Um, but <laughs> significant density increases that change transportation or something that could, you know, significantly impact um, 
uh, areas of the, of the village, that's that's different. If it, it, you know that could uh, a commercial corridor that expands greatly, and I don't I don't have enough knowledge of everything at this point, could then click off uh, something that you know does require a generic. Well, help me understand this because um, my my familiarity with the New Rochelle approach right. and their overlay yeah. zone yes. is that their generic environmental impact statement um, is a particular is a huge assistance for yes. developers that want to come in because yes it they, is and and i assume if we're looking at a gis that's what we're talking about so that a developer comes in and they already have the baseline of the environmental impact statement done they might have pieces that they need to do some additional environmental studies if yes particular there is a benefit stuff. there to the uh, if we do it right which i think we tried hard cool. in yeah. rochelle that's the goal <laughs> and also i give you the current one in mouse kisco because i'm very involved in it right now We've got um, now, as a result of the plan and the zoning and the GEIS mm -hmm. that we did, we have Gotham Realty going to develop about 240 units of housing right at the train station. They are only going to have to do an environmental assessment form followed by a NIGDAC. Reason? We've already studied in the generic transportation, and we've already studied the impact on the school district. So the two big issues that were issues, at least when we developed the plan in Mount Kisco, are addressed by the generic. So from that point of view, that has been very beneficial. And I just want to clarify my understanding and for anybody watching, um, Mount Kisco is obviously very different from New Rochelle, is very different from Austin. Yes. But one of the advantages to doing the GEIS now with all of this public engagement, um, where we're talking about it as a component of the larger comprehensive plan in the whole community, um, is that, you know, when New Rochelle did their overlay zone, they can go up to 48 in, uh, stories high. Obviously, we would not be looking to do anything even resembling that. Um, so the process of doing the GEIS now and having the community involvement means that we would be determining what the environmental impact is based on what we see as appropriate development in, in either the whole village or in just this commercial corridor that we're talking about. Exactly. Right. So that, right. So that when a developer comes in, it's very clear to them. Right. what we as a community have decided is appropriate that's right and and also it leads to the um being able to have the discussions especially here where we know that we have a lot of conflicting objectives and we want to make sure that we're cognizant of impacts particularly on traffic and school which i think come up time and time again when we talk about density frank if I may ask you a quick question in regards to what you said among Kisco and what you were asked to come back um, and didn't have to do this whole process, the whole study, uh, because they didn't have to do that and the village pay for that already. Do they have to pay for the services that, they were, that you guys already provided to the municipality as well as a reimbursement to that portion of the, the work that they don't have to do? Uh, you... In Mount Kisco's case, the answer is no. Um, but could they you? did pay up front for the GEIS. The developer of the um, housing I mentioned, train station, is paying for the EAF, the environmental assessment form that they're doing now. But the fact that they did the GEIS makes his or her burden on the development of the less that they don't have to look at the generic issues of, hey, what's the impacts on traffic a mile away? Or what's the impact on the Bedford School District? Because we've looked at that generically. Yeah. And that means we have leverage to negotiate for other things because they are saving time and money. Yes. That is Mount Kisco's view, I can tell <laughs> yes. you that. Yes, that's, yeah. okay. that's, what, that's, that's how they what have development, yes. the developer yes. impact fees Perfect. that are in New Rochelle that's are more tenable to, because they don't have to spend the time. But yes. Do we still need executive session? Or did no, you, right now. Did you that get question. that answered? Okay. I think Victoria knows where I'm heading, but we'll, we'll <laughs> go over that. Yeah. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that um, it was it was Karen in her office who did all of the due diligence, but Mayor Pickenich from um, Mount Kisco, she 
unsolicited tells me how delighted she was with everything to do with their process. That, and, I, and I didn't even realize at the time that she first told me that it was you. So. Also, if I'm not mistaken, how many of the uh, DRI community, winning communities have you worked in? And is that an omen or, or something? Why because, are you bringing it up? <laughs> no, because, because if, they've, if they've worked in, in, I think it's three of four, so that then, we next. then is that, that what you maybe to say? A, that's maybe saying something for us. So what you're saying is they will rebate this entire cost of 300000 when we get a DRI that they're going to be involved well, in. Well, it oh. just seems to me that there's okay. something happening here. So Okay. Oh, you don't have yeah. to answer that question. Okay. So we're, we're voting. <laughs> yeah, please don't. So we're voting on um, the contract. Next week. Next, Next week, week. Uh, regardless of plan A or plan B, really, because it's just your it's just permission for, you to sign, for me to sign the contract. And it doesn't matter whether it's path A or path B at this point. You, We will right. take the path. And Both options will be reflected in right, the resolution. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That's right. There will be a proposal authorizing the manager to sign. There is no formal. You know, there's something that we obviously have to get something from them in terms of the proposal, right. but both will be there with, you know, Max numbers. Only. Right, okay. Usually it's not more than and Correct. Right. $298,907. Right. I have a right. question. We don't mind rounding off. <laughs> you mean less than that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually rounding off. Yeah. I, I'll donate $7 to the cost. We'll, we'll make it work. Our budget for this is $300,000. Mm -hmm. And if we go with option B, it's two ninety eight uh, nine, so basically two ninety nine. That is very little wiggle room budgetary wise. Is there any reason to uh, <coughs> think about that? Is that any concern at all? Um, I don't believe it is because in addition to um, that budget, um, that budget is specifically for the comprehensive plan. Um, as you know, we have a transportation um, and parking feasibility study that's incremental to that, which can supplement the work. And then we have also I earmarked um, funding for um, uh, community mitigation studies as well as um, economic development studies. So we have other resources. So should we need them to supplement what we're doing? Um, so I don't think there's any reason to consider a budget adjustment at this point. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Thank you so much. Do we want to do the... If, as long as yeah. you don't think it's going to be more than 15 minutes? Uh, I, I don't think so. Great. Um, so, so we just have a slight change in schedule. Um, I, we want to take advantage of the fact that um, we have uh, uh, Father Elvin from St. Anne's in the audience. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Chief Sylvester up to talk about uh, processions that uh, St. Anne's does throughout the year. As you all know, we live in a wonderfully diverse community that's rich in cultures and um, that is displayed in many many wonderful ways um, this um, this meeting is to discuss the uh, schedule for processions that st. Anne is proposing so that the board is aware so that the community is also aware because they do come take place um, uh, sometimes on Main Street and, and other places um, usually around um, Holy Holidays, and uh, we'd like to talk about that and understand more what that means and how we can be supportive of the diversity of culture that we have, but also mindful of resources in the village, as well as the fact that we are a very diverse community and we have a, a lot of different cultural opportunities. We want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to participate as well. So. Thank you, Chief Sylvester. Sure. So I understand that delivered to the board has been a list of processions that have been requested by St. Anne's Church. Uh, those span from April 5th, with the first one being on Palm Sunday, a little bit later than usual this year, as far as the beginning of their processions, and spanning right through December 19th for uh, for El Nino Dios. Um, among these, this year, 12 processions in the past, we've done 13 or 14, so it's a slight decrease from what we've seen in the past. Um, one of the conversations we have with St. Anne's uh, quite frequently is uh, our preference to not cross Route 9 with processions. It becomes uh, a bit of a safety issue for us. It's a traffic issue for us. Uh, there are particular reasons Father Alvin shared that uh, different groups uh, feel that it's extremely important for them to have that opportunity. But notwithstanding, um, I've spoken with him and I've shared with the board a number of times that we would prefer that those processions not cross Route 9 for for those safety, uh, financial, and, and traffic reasons that are there. 
Um, beyond that, it, it's it's fairly similar to what we've seen in the past. So I'll leave it open to the board with any questions. I guess um, my question is not necessarily for the chief, but for the manager's office. Um, I know that we are undertaking a new approach to events this year, and that is well underway. I don't know what the timeline for that is, but it seems like this would be uh, the, the new approach would be relevant to most of these dates. So one, one of the things that, and this came up in discussions uh, last year about events, event policies, and, and this really speaks to the fact that uh, we're not a community that does one or two major events a year anymore. In fact, we have many, 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 many events and requests for new events every day, um, which is a really great thing. Um, but um, virtually all the events require um, time of our staff. Um, they sometimes um, uh, interrupt traffic or parking. Um, there's a lot of different things that go into events. And while we want to support events and processions and, and parades and all things that give our community opportunity to get together, um, we do sometimes get complaints from people about certain things too. So um, we want to look at things a little bit differently. We also have to be conscious. And I think the board and the taxpayers need to be aware of what this costs the village. Um, so those will be things that we're talking about. And we are, we really want to hear from people who participate in events. So on February 24th at 6 p.m. at the Community Center, we um, have invited the key stakeholders, and if other people want to come, we'll be publicizing the meeting to talk about events, to talk about ways we can make sure we're working together to optimize them, and that we also have greater understanding of other uh, community points of views and things so that we really make them things that everybody feels good about, even if they don't participate. So, um, and that will involve a conversation about how um, we can manage vis village resources more efficiently. Um, you know, right now, uh, most of the resources put towards these events are, are you know, not reimbursed necessarily. Um, and as we do more and more events, there is more and more cost. So it's cost of overtime for sanitation, for the police department, for other um, village entities. And we just want to make sure we're, we're certainly not looking to make money, but we want to be able to support the events, but also be responsible because ultimately it's taxpayer dollars that we're spending. And we do have to be sensitive too um, about limitations of government agencies, municipal agencies using the funding in an appropriate way. So even if it's in the form of services. So while we want to be as inclusive and as supportive possible, we also really need to, as things have gotten so, uh, robust. We want to make sure that we can continue to sustain that. So this will be part of that discussion and, and we have um, St. Anne's is invited to that meeting as well and um, you know really it's really our way to do things better and be supportive but we all have to get together and look at what that looks like for the future. Yeah Chief, um, on the average what's the length of one of these processions on the average? Oh, it, I mean, it really depends because um, some of them are very small. Uh, for instance, the, I, I very quickly won't see, but the Italian group only goes up uh, Ellis Place around Churchill and back down Eastern. That one's very short, maybe 20, 30 minutes. Um, some of the other ones are for coming from Nelson Park. Obviously, Good Friday is the exception to the rule. That's, that's a full-blown parade. But um, if we're coming from Nelson Park, those may last 45 minutes to an hour. Um, you know, the challenge for us typically with Route 9 is that uh, obviously if it's after dark, that's particularly dangerous because of people being in the roadway. But uh, where we stop traffic there, uh, people don't often realize how much, uh, what a volume of traffic we have on Route 9. And when we close it down, uh, we find out very quickly <laughs> because it backs up uh, in a hurry. Um, that said, I, you know, there are groups that there are particular reasons. Um, I'm not familiar with the particular organizers of some of them, but I know, for instance, the Portuguese club has a holiday and a patron saint it is a patron saint for them um and they want to come from their club which happens to be across right nine so we try our best to accommodate as many people as we can but um you know i, I have to make the board aware that we receive a number of complaints anytime we close route nine like that uh we try to do it as quickly and safely as possible but it remains a challenge and on the uh the bigger events i'm assuming that you bring in extra resources for this or there are we don't tie up any sectors or 
No, no. Th these, these. I mean, we've done in a couple of emergencies where uh, staffing shortages when we were short staffed, and it's vacation seasons and things like that, where we've pulled the sector car to help in a pinch, right? Um, or if there was some other emergency going on. But generally, no. This is all done on overtime. All right. Thank you. Unless we have extra staff. If we have above minimum staffing, we'll pull people from the roll call for that, as we would with any other event. Okay. Thanks, Chief. So, just so I understand, I'm figuring there are 52 weekends in a year. Most of these things are on weekends, or are they all during the week as well? I don't believe, I don't, are any of them weekdays? Okay. Okay. And, um, this is one church. So we have 22 houses of worship in this in the village of Asani. Um, and just doing the math, I mean, New York City, with its size, limits a number of parades and events to avenues. I mean, they're very specific now. The county limits them because given the number of weeks and weekends and the part of where we live means that a third of them are in the winter, and so they can't really be done then. Um, it just seems to me when you do the math, Karen, that you're going to have to look at all of these, the processions, the events, uh, the use of parks, the use of public streets. Um, we've recently um, received, and all of us received it, um, that ambulances can't get through because of parking scenarios. Um, so all of that, I assume you're taking into account because um, illegal parking um, and whether people get ticketed or not, I mean, there's, there's a slew of sort of levers that happen, right? One thing sets off another. I have to tell you that it's terrifying on Route 9 when there are processions going on, because I've driven down Route 9. It's a main highway. I mean, it's one of the only areas that commercial vehicles can actually travel with when you look at a, like a map. Um, you know, when you're trying to come north to south from Poughkeepsie, and you look at the ability of commercial vehicles, like trucks and moving vehicles, there are actually not a lot of highways to go through the Hudson Valley. And route, that route becomes a big area. And they're traveling at a relatively high speed. Um, and so I'm assuming like every time you move one lever, you go, something else happens. So you're looking at this, you're looking at the use of parks, you're looking at shutting down a village um, for events, for parades, um, and all of the other scenarios. Because I remember we had this discussion. We, we are looking. This is being included in this that is, whole thing. This is being included. So we are including all this. And, and the, the February um, 24th meeting is an opportunity to get feedback and also to have everybody in the same room so we get feedback because some of the feedback um, may conflict with each other, what yeah. certain groups want to do. Um, and, and I think it's really important that we are a diverse community, which we like to celebrate and we want to um, encourage and we think is wonderful. One of the biggest challenges about living is in a diverse community is we are a diverse community. And that means people have a lot of different viewpoints. Um, we have many, many different faiths. We have many different points of view. Marrying those can be challenging in terms of making sure that um, uh, we are respectful of different cultures, um, but also respectful that we all have to coexist together in a, in a, in a not a very homogeneous cultural environment. So it's our hope that we can get a conversation going. Um, I, I think that if, you know, last year and the, the board members over here and some of you who maybe watched the boarding meetings, this became a very, a very much of a hot button issue and a very emotional issue. So there is nobody who comes to the village and says, we're doing this really horrible event and you're not going to want to support it. Um, or we have so much money, we can just do it on our own and don't worry about it, we'll give you some extra money. Um, everybody comes and they want to do these wonderful things. Um, sometimes it's hard to communicate why those really wonderful things can be problematic. So road closings that maybe compromise other people's ability to get to work or do what they need to do means that as, as great as any procession can be, we also are going to get complaints about that. When we have uh, festivals on um, the street, when we close parking lots, what's really great for one group of people may, may mean that some businesses are impacted that day. So this is not to place judgment on any of these events. It's to make sure that as we do them that we're all cognizant of that. We're cognizant of the limitation of what a municipality can do realistically to support them. 
and that what the implications of not just one event, but literally we're talking probably close to 100 events a year um, has. And That was and my comment about 52 weekends in a year and how many events. We have one. We, have. We, I, we probably have some sort of event at least every week. Most of them are not any major impact, but certainly during the warmer months, it becomes very, very challenging. And um, we want to, you know, we want to be true to the fact that, like, we want to see events, we want to facilitate them, we want to streamline certainly the process of permitting events and, and how people go through that, and that'll be a big piece of it too. But we do have to have a community conversation about how we manage all these things, because if we are going to live in a diverse community and really embrace that, then we have to embrace the fact that that will mean a certain amount of compromise on certain issues. Um, the, the other thing I want to be real clear is that we want to have a policy as a government, once we do something for one group or, or one person, you know, it, it, there's no picking and choosing here. So anything we do, we have to do it with the expectation that if others want to do that too, we have to be able to absorb that capacity. It is a consideration. So as I look at this at the calendar, I'm looking at the processions um, that are requested for 2020, and I'm looking at the just 2020 calendar, and it'll be the 24th of February when the village has the stakeholder meetings and talks about um, events, everything to do with events and, and how our policy is uh, proposed to go forward. Um, it, it's going to take a couple of weeks before that comes back to the village board and all of the input has been has been incorporated and, and there's a proposal of a recommended policy going forward for events. So realistically, that won't come to us until March. I don't know if there's any legislative action that needs to be taken or if it's just a policy change that can be adopted relatively quickly, but I'm looking at the St. Anne's calendar and it seems unlikely that there will be a new event policy in place in time for them to really be able to be in compliance with that for their Palm Sunday on, on April 5th or their Good Friday on April 10th. So it, it seems like a, a good next step would be, you know what the Palm Sunday thing is, we, you know what Good Friday is. We, we've been handling these long for before years. the board was looking at them. So Absolutely. yeah, we're, we're prepared. So um, it, I, I would be comfortable in saying, um, let's go forward and say we're comfortable with having the uh, the April events as they have been, and then the next thing isn't until June thirteenth, and by that point, <coughs> it'll, another month and a half will have gone by. We may have a better handle on on what the village um, is is implementing for our events policy and how that might impact the processions. And again, I want to cat you know um, because Father Elvin is is here tonight, and we're speaking specifically about the processions. Um, this is a discussion for um, St. Anne's to provide input to us on what we can, you know, how we can work together to make sure that we can support the things that um, St. Anne wants to do in the context of the greater community. Um, so we're hoping that it's, you know, we, we're really not looking to, you know, um, you know, change anything dramatically, but we just want to make sure that as we're doing this, that we can do this in a sustainable, responsible way that is our responsibility. So hopefully uh, we're looking forward to a, a very positive discussion on how to move forward. And I think that um, I have uh, confidence that once we have everybody's understanding of what the issues are on the table more fully, and I know that there's been historic discussions that the chief has had with St. Anne's over the years too, um, we look to honor those and, and move forward in a way that works for everybody as best it, as we can. Um. This question is for the chief and madam manager. Uh, I'm curious about what your response is to folks when they do call in and uh, complain about whatever it is that they complain about. Um, what do you say? That's a that's a five page thesis, I suppose. I mean, I mean, I, it really depends on what somebody calls about. I mean, look, I, I read the email that alleges that we show up and don't do anything. Um, I'd have to know the date and time that that happened and the cop that was on the call and check body cams to verify all of that. I'll tell you that a standard practice, if I were to handle the call, would be this. Uh, in dealing particularly with the religious institutions, discretion is an incredibly powerful tool that we have. We have a village code with regard to noise. We have things about trash. We have things about parking. Um, generally where we go to gatherings, whether they be religious, cultural, or otherwise, we do our best to help neighbors get along. 
Um, our goal is not to arrest people. Our goal is not to write tickets. Our goal is to keep a happy, healthy, and vibrant community. So, uh, for instance, if we were called to St. Anne's for a noise complaint, um, typically a supervisor, if it's a very large event, would go speak to Father Elvin because there's sort of an understanding that we've got a boss and they've got a boss. And, um, you know, it's a conversation. Uh, can I tell you if there's been a ticket written to a church, any church in Austin? Probably not as long as I've worked here. I don't know the last person that's written a ticket to a priest. I don't know if those happen very often. Um, I don't know for what reason. I'm not saying that they, you know, I don't know. Um, but look, discretion's a powerful tool. And, and quite frankly, when people call about noise and things like that, in any instance, whether it be a religious, cultural, or even just general residence, our first stop is always to go and ask the person to lower the noise and do something to help get along with neighbors. Um, uh, you can probably imagine that if every time you call the police and said the neighbors make noise, we go and drop a ticket on them, neighbors won't get along very well. It leads to more calls to the police, so we're trying to make less calls to the police. Not that we don't want to do it, but we want people to get along. So uh, that's the broad scope of how we would generally handle something like that. Uh, but, you know, I understand that some people feel that, um, you know, they live in the area of the church, that they're, there are festivals and things like that that sometimes go into the evening hours, and uh, some people are displeased with the, our policies been on allowing that. That may be something to be part of this conversation on the 24th. Yeah, but with all due respect, we spend a lot of our time as legislators uh, passing laws about this. So if it doesn't get enforced, and if the people involved don't know about all of this, and the neighbors complain, and these are people who also live in this community. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I mean, okay. if we're talking about That's the email correct. that was sent, so sure. I spent lots of my time last year, in the last two years, as have other people who've sat here. And if it's not being involved, I mean, people send us videos of the decibels of the sound and that nobody came to check that out. If I had a party in my house and I did that, my neighbors have a right to complain about it, and the police are supposed to go and look at it. Not with the theory that if they go out, more neighbors will call you, but you're not supposed to do so. I mean, Scarborough Manor went through like, I don't know, weeks of discussions about something they did, which was a really good thing that they did. We were excited that they were so concerned about their neighbors, the neighborhood, what they were doing there. Um, I'm sorry, am I wrong that they went no, through a lot of trouble to do that? I, I was trying to remember what you're referring to. Right. Okay. So, no, I thought maybe I had it wrong. I wasn't being cute. I just, I remember there was, right, Stuart, you went. Well, it was generated. Yeah, I mean, they went through all this stuff because they were aware of the laws and the policies, and they were, like, being really great neighbors. They were being great neighbors not only for their own sake. They were being great neighbors to the, literally their neighbors and their neighborhood. From my perspective, if we spend our time doing our job on behalf of all of the public, then the public has a right to expect that when they call, that it is addressed. They really do. And it really isn't uh, fair to the legislators who sat here for two years, who did their job, myself included, and to other people here. I can't really. In some ways, it's sort of not fair to have us do our job and then not carry through. There is no malice in any of this. There is no um, desire to do any of this. We have lots of religious institutions that have been here for who knows how many years with histories, all of them. And this is, this is not just one church. It's like a lot of them. There are many times in the middle of residential areas. So I'm just going to take a little bit of a step back. I'm jumping off your question to what the police does, but it really isn't fair when we take our time to do that, that it then doesn't get followed. There, there is a balance in, in communities, a balance of the different bodies of government doing their job. I'm not really happy to hear. I, I so think I, 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 I have to. Saying, but I, but honestly, it's, you know, the statement that we don't enforce, that's not what I said. I never said that we don't enforce. And to blanketly accept any email you get from a person that complains, if that were the case, if we accepted every allegation that came in, we'd fire the entire department several times over. Now, I said, I can go back and find the date. I'll find out who the cop was, I'll check for body cam footage, and we can go back. This is not an appropriate form to go over a particular call. But I never said we don't enforce. However, in the law enforcement world, there are degrees of enforcement. 
Now, if every time somebody violates the noise ordinance, it's the board's prerogative that we immediately issue tickets, by all means, the board should ask for that to be a policy. But I'll tell you, there will be a room full of people at every single board meeting from now on. This community survives on discretion. It is, it, it, policing exists on the good judgment of our cops. That's why we hire people and send them out to do the job. I never said they don't enforce, but there are more ways to do this than just with tickets. Um, Abby, you had asked what happened. I'm not that's not sure to say that we're not willing to write a ticket. If we have I'm to write a ticket, we will. But I think I have a more anything. context for this. Right. So, um, you know, as, as first responders, police go out when they hear a complaint and then um, settle it by degree of, you know, if we can get people to work it together, we do. When when the manager's office get to, gets the complaint, it's usually <laughs> after the fact. And the way we're doing it is, is really what we're responding to is, again, something very egregious we take immediate action on. But when we're talking about things where there's just different perspectives, so whether it's complaints about an event that a lot of people go to and like, but then somebody who lives next door to it was like, you know what, this is night five, I haven't slept, and there's people outside my house at 3 o'clock in the morning who are drunk, that happens. So what we do is we take that in, we try to address it, but what we really want to do and what the purpose of this whole exercise and looking at how we're doing is really bringing the community together because the only way this is going to work is if we really get this out in the open and we don't necessarily have, these are conversations to your point that we can have as good neighbors because I don't think any organization that's doing an event wants anybody to feel badly about their event Nuts. and i don't think anybody who's you know complaining event about event an event necessarily wants that event to stop but what what really has come to light is that if we're going to solve these issues we're going to have to talk to each other and it's really about communication that's what we're trying to foster and we want to support our officers when they're called to these things so that when they're responding to things they can focus on those things that are really egregious and we can help facilitate the community dialogue that we need to make sure that um, we're, we're um, addressing the issues, but in, again, in, in a sane, responsible way. So I think that um, if I'm sitting here listening to this, I, I, I heard different things from both of you. I think they're both very valid. Um, our community, if we have noise ordinances, and if we have certain rules and, and then we change the rule or, or we make an allowance for something, that's when we get into trouble. So this is, I thank you for the clarity around it because we were in a meeting on Monday and had this and it really does come to consistency. The Absolutely. whole conversation comes to consistent behavior that has input from the community and understanding and then people actually sticking to what they all agree to. It's all about what you said before, how we treat one, which speaks to everything we've worked on. And now we're at a place where we can do it. I think Victoria was going with a timeline because it sounds like a, well, we're on a I mean, there's a timeline for one discussion that's coming up here tonight, but the larger picture. So the larger picture is we'll meet um, on, on February 24th. We, are, we already, uh, Jamie Hoffman and Bill Garrison have done a tremendous amount of work on this already, just gathering best practices and talking to other communities um, to set sort of a framework. And then when we talk to the community, we'll distill that information. Uh, tentatively, we have uh, Bill Garrison on the calendar for, I think it's the March 25th wor work session to discuss that, as well as um, other, other March 25th. And then we can, um, we can go forward. By that time, we will do email communication with you to keep you abreast of the directionally where we're going, and we'll, we'll be able to communicate with people. And, and uh, it will be somewhat of an iterative process to get to that point where you can be prepared for that meeting and we can make decisions going forward on on policies that we have, policies that we'd like to change, and if there are, there may be some things that require code changes, um, but we can then move forward. Um, so again, it, it really is about, this is a, a listening exercise and making sure people feel that they're being heard. Um, and that means, again, a diverse community, a lot of people, a lot of voices. We just wanna make sure people are heard and then when we come forward with a proposal, we can say it was informed, we can say that we are going to enforce it consistently, and that we've listened, and of course, things evolve too. We will continue to evolve and hone. 
So um, there are a couple of different elements to this conversation, um, and they are very much related, but I'd like to bring us back to this specific request for tonight that has brought Father Alvin here and Chief Sylvester, which is the processions. Mm -hmm. And we have a list of the processions that are the um, St. Anne's would like to have this year. The first two are clearly going to happen before we've really been able to have this full conversation with the stakeholders and the board of, of how we want to approach events going forward. So um, for the purposes of tonight, I'd like to propose that the Palm Sunday and the Good Friday processions should move forward as they have. And then by the time we, um, as we move closer to the June date, we will hopefully have some clarity on what the village's process is going to be going forward because it looks like it's going to be quite different. But hopefully it'll be more clear and easily communicated and I hope that you're able to be part of the conversation. Could, if you'd like to approach, please do. We ask you to be on the mic just so the folks at home can hear you. Thank you, Father. Good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. And I'd like to just address for the sound and the procession thing. Um, I've gone out of my way working with Chief Sylvester and the other officers uh, to make sure that when it comes to noise complaints and the like that we get, that I take care of it before the cops are even called. Uh, it tends to be the case that whenever we have something, my measure is it shouldn't go past the parking lot. And there's no reason why something going on in the gym should go up outside past the parking lot. So I tend to be the one going inside. And I understand Father Ed used to always do the same thing, uh, to go inside and tell them to lower the music. And the like, what I can't stop is things like the festival or when we have an outdoor mass. Things like that, those are religious events. Uh, and they tend to be a, a bit louder when we're having an outdoor mass. And like, so sorry about that. Uh, but I do try to control uh, the noise complaints of anything's going on inside. As for complaints in general, I've heard from several of our neighbors and I've always invited them. And I've had, I had a couple of ladies that wanted to come and if they're listening now, um, uh, they wanted to supposed to come and meet with me. And I opened the door said, and I spoke to whoever it was, uh, that was speaking to me about that. It was Katie at the time. And I invited them to come and speak with me so I could talk more with them. Never showed up responding to emails, just get angry responses back. And anytime someone calls and speaks, I always open the door for them to speak uh, about it. As for the processions, we're very happy uh, on the support that we've gotten. Very happy with the support that the police has given us. Um, and I will definitely be attending that meeting uh, to make sure to speak more about that. I hope to have ongoing support from the village. Thank you. Um, the nature of my question uh, initially, which was uh, uh, the chief and madam manager, is <coughs> recognizing that there is uh, a ton of discretion in the in this process and more than anything i'm just i was just curious uh really what you say because you're not going to tell them all right i'll tell them not to have their parade or not to have their event or not to whatever um so yeah that was the the nature of my question recognizing that there's a lot of distance between doing nothing and like a ticket or something that's much more punitive um so thank you thank you father for coming thank you chief I agree, the first two, and then take it from there. Thanks for the meeting. I think we're good. I haven't said anything. Oh, so please. Got it. Please. Thank you. I oh, appreciate that. Oh, good. Um, thank you, Chief. <laughs> thank you, Father uh, Alvin, for coming in. Um, it's actually the first time in my time that I, um, someone from the church, actually, second time someone from the church has come in and presented the schedule for the year. Um, and I think this is going to be essential for us moving forward. I agree as well with the two processions on, on hand right now on, on April to go forward. Um, one thing that I think is essential, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to be part of this meeting, the next meeting, but something that just as a general keep in mind is timing. Sure, I, I know our police department does the schedule uh, ahead of time for the whole year. Mm -hmm. And I think it's essential for us to keep that in mind when we are looking to do any event in, in our community. Um, you know, and I always go back to Captain Craven, the, the, the way that he used to do. I know you guys changed that, but he used to spread out the whole table with the schedule and it was really amazing to see. Um, as to say, I, I think is, you know, we did have a meeting last year, Father Alvin. I, I, I was part of the meeting and our previous trustee was there. One of the asks at that time was, um, you know, for, for you to work with definitely our police department, which I think you have. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the reasons was because a lot of the coordination needs to be flushed out before it comes to us, make sure the police was okay with all that stuff. Uh, 
but usually we had asked to come in with an agenda for the beginning of the year. Um, so it's a little, I'm not saying it's too late, but you know, do we have any procession? So I, I don't, I don't want to speak for Father Rome, but I, I think this is the conversation he had with Lieutenant Slater was just that um, he's coordinating a number of different groups. And sometimes it's hard to get those folks together yeah. in December to promise for next year. Yeah, is that, not, not, you want this? Not. Otherwise they won't hear you. <laughs> it's for the public. It's That's uh, fine. Um, yeah, I do remember that meeting. It was a very good meeting. Uh, not only, it wasn't just that it was going late. That the problem procession that we had and the only persons that we had were two in january and those have been canceled okay uh, so we got them in the, a little uh, as when you got them there because there was nothing coming up until april okay. so is it, there was I not too much of us, yeah. and again it's, it's more to me and, and i'm glad to hear that you got been working with uh with our police department in regards to the schedule because i think that's essential for, for our police department to be aware of what is happening you know, a couple months ahead. And I think that's part of my ass for, for a village manager is to whatever the, in the 24 happens, I think it's essential for us, if we're gonna start coordinating all these events are happening in our village, you know, it's essential for us to see what is what that means for our police department itself. You know, what what does that mean for, for their services? Not just the police department, obviously, but the people and you know, parks and, and everything else. So I think that's <coughs> something that, I'm looking forward to see. Father, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming in tonight. Yeah. Thanks. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I think it comes back to um, I'm glad sure. you seem to have some consensus that the, mm -hmm. the April events just go ahead as you always have. Right. Um, but it, as Karen was pointing out, there are so many different events, types of events, processions, parades, picnics, festivals. Um, and there hasn't been a very clear path for how a person who wants to have an event um, should come to the village and then what the village resources are and how the compensation has worked out. And so I'm really grateful that um, Jamie and Bill have um, come up with a proposal and that we're now going to have all the stakeholders and the village board reviewing what the proposal is so that there's continuity and there's consistency so that everybody is treated fairly and so that the, the community is, is um, able to feel confident that everybody is treated fairly and, and that there's uh, it doesn't matter who you are, who you know, or how long you've been doing it, that, um, that we're, uh, we're being thoughtful in our approach. And I am grateful that we're going to finally really have a policy that we can all feel good about and, and be able to predict what's being asked of everyone. So thank you for, um, for your patience as we uh, go through this new process and for your participation so that it can really be a, a good process. Mayor, may I just make one point? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the code requires that the parade, which this is, is granted by the manager. So I understand the board has indicated its interest in proceeding, but if you remember, we did change the code that this is no longer a board <laughs> approval, this is a manager approval based upon the permit. I, I think, I hope the manager is uh, mindful of the, the sense of the board that she's hearing this evening. Um, in, in every manager approval, um, there is a real desire to seek consensus and guidance from the board. So, a lot of discretion, right? <laughs> yes. Or a yes. Of Thank you. Why is it on the agenda? Alrighty. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Chief. And Thank you, Madam Clerk, for your patience. I did not realize you were going to be asked to be so patient, but we appreciate it. Do you want to introduce Sue? I do. Um, so we're we're we are also following on our on our um, theme tonight of consistency and streamlined management. That's our theme. We're having um, that's our theme. Okay. So our theme tonight. So so we want to invite um, our 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 town and village clerk Suzanne Donnelly up to talk about. Um, some changes to the way we deal with our municipal lot and and parking in the municipal plot and how we and how we do tags in the municipal lot because this is another area where consistency and um, uh, uniformity and 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 ease of process will make a great uh, will be a great benefit to our residents as as well to ourselves and certainly on the administrative end. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce Madam Clark. 
Well, thank you very much. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for seeing us tonight or me tonight, um, uh, representing the clerk's office. Um, and so we started out, we have now been uh, in the clerk's office under this little clerk's administration for six weeks. I kind of had to tell the chamber that yesterday when they asked me how many software changes I had made and where was the program and where was the training. But uh, one of the things that came up quite quickly was um, during the month of December, January, and into February, the, uh, the clerk's office in the village of Osning is a parking authority. And we do so much work with the parking. Now, one of the things that's easier to remedy some of the issues that we have is the lot, the municipal lot day and night parking. It is not the meter parking. It is not the three hour parking. It is not the train parking. So I'd like to pass it back to um, Maddie because she is taking this on as what she's been delegated. This is one of her projects and together we have met with the police department who uh, we invited in the parking enforcement people because it's always good to hear this from the source. And uh, we came up with some great concepts and ideas of how we can handle this quite quickly. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so I've circulated a memo. Um, most of this information is um, something that I sent out to the board on Friday. Um, the only information that's going to be new to you, board, um, is on the second page under Board of Trustees Action Requested. Um, but just for the sake of the folks who are listening, um, I will sort of go through what um, Clerk Donnelly um, discussed. Um, so after having the meeting last week with representatives of the police department and the code enforcement staff and the clerk's office, um, several issues came to light about how the administration of the municipal parking tags has gone. Um, there are several different issues, um, many of which were, were echoed by the different folks in the room. Um, so the first one is probably that um, they're getting a lot of complaints that we're overselling the permits. Um, so they've done a count about how many spots that we have. It's difficult for them to know at this time exactly how many permits exist for a number of reasons. Um, the software that we use to produce the permits and keep track of who has permits um, is something that uh, the, the system is not an internal system. So they basically have to go out to uh, Crystal Reports, which is an arm of Complus, um, in order to get that report, which is not always easily accessible to them. Um, also, the fact that the permits are issued on a rolling basis, so if you came in on March 1st of 2020, your permit would be good until February 28th of 2021. Um, for that reason, it's sort of difficult to keep track of how many permits there are um, out in the world. Um, additionally, something that the um, enforcement officers noted is that it's not um, super easy for them to scan a lot and see um, if there are people in there who shouldn't be there, if there are people in there with overnight tags parking during the day, um, and so on and so forth. So they made a couple of recommendations. Um, the uh, tag paper, I guess, that the tags are, are printed on um, is not especially distinctive. So they, they've noticed a couple counterfeits while, while they've been out there, which we obviously would like to avoid. Um, and, and there's photocopied evidence of, of much of this that they were very happy to share during the meeting. Is there a black market for uh, tags out there somewhere? <laughs> Trust 11, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Um, so there were also some issues of consistency. So when the clerk's office sells daytime passes, they can sell them for a quarter. I mean a quarter meaning three months out of the year, not a quarter, or they can sell them for an entire year, whereas the overnight passes are in six months and one year, so there's not really any consistency there. Um, so again, these are all things that I outlined in, in the memo, um, but also that, that the board had seen last week. Um, so what our ask is of the board, um, and in speaking with Corporation Council, there are several things that have to be changed in the village code in order for the clerk's office to effectively take over the administration of this program wholesale. 
Um, so some of the back end stuff having to do with moving away from the Complus vendor um, is is sort of an internal thing that uh, Lieutenant Damiano has been very helpful with in sort of, um, and if you look in the packet, what you have there, those are some of the um, passes that they're going to be able to uh, help us to produce with software we already have in-house um, that are also going to include a hologram. So we're hoping that that, that will um, discourage the uh, counterfeiting of those passes. Um, something else that had been recommended is adding a plate number um, to the tag. So right now you would be issued tag number one, two, three, and you could give it to your friend if, if they were going to stay for the night. Um, it's been suggested by not only the police department, but also the enforcement officers that they be actually attached to a license plate um, number. And I will sort of let uh, the clerk give her opinion. Yes, uh, I think this is part of this part of it is essential. Um, we have uh, many people that come in and it is such a generic form that we use right now. We use the same color paper for the day and the night. It's confusing. They have two tags in their window. It's actually a, it's actually a piece of paper. It's folded in half and it resides in their window. And so we're very, very anxious to A1, take control of the files um, that, and build our own files from the uh, Crystal Reports is a software package that many people use, but Complus uses it for, to write our applications. They use it as for the tickets in the uh, courthouse and we use it um, in the clerk's office. Um, it is, uh, we just need to move on. So um, what we would love to do is to do this type of package. We've been working, as, as, as Maddie has said, we've been working with the police department um, in, over the last few weeks that we have been here to get this resolved. The, uh, one of the uh, asks that we have is to look at the six month, three month, and one year tag. I will tell you that on some people that um, are forced to use the uh, parking lots, especially for overnight, uh, especially for daytime parking, it is a stretch for them to uh, pay more than a quarter at a time. So we have to take that into consideration when we look for the, at the pricing of this. Um, the fact that it's rolling is unbelievable. It's, you never know who's going to walk in and there's constantly tags expiring. So uh, this is what we're asking for. Um, we would like to implement it as early as April 1st. If the board can help us move it forward, you'll have to have, uh, in order to have changes in the code and Corporation Council can address this, that we'll have to have a public hearing and uh, certain things. Right, sir? Um, I just want to be super clear. So um, in terms of what actually needs to be changed in the code is actually somewhat limited. Um, because the code um, has, there's actually, I think, um, 10 or 12 different letters um, that could be used on a tag, many of which, you know, there's a notation, this is no longer used as of some date. Um, so the first ask is to change the L and the P to the word day and the word, or the letter O to night. Um, also, we wanted to ask for a provision. Um, as the clerk mentioned, there's often people putting a day sticker next to their night sticker. There's no option right now for the clerk's office to sell a 24 hour municipal lot pass. Um, what is a 24 hour? It's a day and a night. They can literally leave the So they, the they never move. They will never move. Well, a 24 hour tag would be what is the equivalent of what we sell right now in a day tag plus a night tag because they. One goes eight to six, one goes six to eight. So there's no time period that they have to move the car. If we did, uh, you know, if you want to consider some, that, that would stay consistent with what we have. If you want to do something where they had to move their cars, you know, to a different spot, um, then that would be another consideration that could be done after this initial one of us changing the tags to actually be easily read by the parking enforcement. But right now, somebody just buys day and night. There's no provision that they have to move their car. No, there's no provision that so, they have to move their so car. So functionally, you're not asking for a change. You're just asking right. for a state. Exactly. And, and again, that needs to be addressed down the road, possibly, because we have limited spaces in our lots, especially in the downtown area. There's another, there's going to be another suggestion that comes up is allow overnight parking in the 
oh, one parking, the larger parking lot outside the post office has no parking overnight. So therefore, the people that have night only pa passes can't park there. Um, you know, so there's uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of operational things that are not we're not considering tonight. Yeah. Okay, we're not there. Okay. Yeah. Um, but we're there. We're there just to clean up what we now. You're just doing so. what we have now, changing some words to clarify. Speech. And changing the tag. What a tag but, but but Maddie, I. I just to clarify, so this is step one for what we're doing now. As we look at parking right. in the context, like we could change the way we're using those lots and metering and everything too. So this is no, like, this is this is clear, really this just is the low-hanging fruit. What what is really make sure we can manage it yeah, in the short term. That was, right. that was um, where I was heading. The the other two components that we're asking the board to to allow us to address um, immediately having to do with the code change um, is that passes can no longer be sold on a rolling basis. So again, if you come in on March first, it'll be prorated through the end of 2020. But as of January first, you have to come in and get an, and get a new annual pass, which is going to be a different color, and that will also help our enforcement officers so to say. Tell me how currently someone buys these passes. They come into the clerk's office. Uh, they are asked immediately if they are renewing their pass or are they getting a new one. If they're renewing it, they go into a report. It's a report application, and they input it in. They put a, a special stock into the printer. They print out this pass that says nothing about that car. It says nothing. It, it says these very cryptic little O's and L's and P's. And um, and then they they pay their money and they go off with their car and it has a date and, and so it has. You're going to have that and you're going to have the license so that it's one per car so somebody can't do that. Right. Okay. And it's going to hang from it's going to hang like a tag like a handicap tag. You know, it's easier for the people to realize a handicap tag. It's not as big as a handicap tag, but it will hang from their uh, rearview mirror. And that way, they can walk through the parking lot and check them very quickly, which is what we want them to do. That we want our parking enforcement people to be have their to make it as easy. And they had a tremendous amount of input. I do want to continuously thank them for having so much input to, to putting this together. Um, I assume if it's going to be if there's going to be license plate specific, that at some point we'll be using plate reader technology. I would say that's part of your whole concept of, of parking, and. Uh, Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm not. I'm seeing the um, the proposed language, Stuart. I, I assume you've either seen it or had something to do with it. I I, I discussed with uh, Maddie and Sue what changes for this initial stage we needed legislative. Right. And so there's no legislative change needing to to tie it to a plate to be plate specific because that I don't see that here. A code of silence. Code okay. of silence. So then let's not that, let's more not invent code from there. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. I have, I have a yeah. few questions. I, I'm not sure you guys were done. Almost done. Can I just wrap it up with two more sentences and then I'll be completely done? Um, so this is sort of step one. Um, like I said, sort of low hanging fruit. Um, the second component to this is the paragraph second to the bottom um, that has to do with the fee schedule because something else um, that came up in our conversations is that there are plenty of places to park around Ossining that. Um, but we, we don't feel like the passes are competitively priced. So we want to do a little bit more research um, about that. So we may be coming to you in the next couple of months um, to discuss uh, the fee schedule, which is also attached to the back of your packet. Um, take a look at that. Um, and also the uh, replacement and lost permits issue. So right now um, the clerk's office expressed that folks are coming in and saying, you know what, I actually, um, you know, I, I want to transfer this. So I don't want to spend the whole $100 again. I want to transfer it to my friend. Um, and so basically talking about how many times you're able to, to make that swap. And now if there's a license plate associated with it, are we going to be allowing that sort of swap at all? Um, so that's sort of a preview of the next part of this conversation. Um, and I don't have anything else at this time. Did you want to ask a question? No, go ahead. So, so we do need uh, that addressed that... Um, the loss or change of a tag. Uh, we do have uh, several people that buy multiple tags and they sometimes have change employees. Um, but what we don't want to do is for some minimal fee, uh, have someone come in and say, I lost my tag. Uh, and that's why it's critical to have the license plate on it because I lost my tag and next thing you know, they have 
two tags or three tags. So we, what we want to do is we want to uh, limit the uh, amount of times, uh, not limit them, but restrict how how they can change their, the, come in and just randomly say that they lost a tag. Um, if they, if you had a, I, I would like to suggest that if you have a company and they bought several tags, that if they have a change in one of their employees, they simply send a letter over with the tag with with the tag and we'll replace it we'll have the light we'll have we'll have the new license plate we'll have the old license plate and what we have done is we do mail out uh quite a few of our tags in the first place and with the mail being the mail uh, we sometimes find ourselves issuing a second tag uh, for something i know and it's it so you can imagine it's me doing this too so it's you know it's slightly mind-boggling so yes, and I'm ready for questions. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Uh, it's very helpful. Um, so I have several questions um, on this because uh, the past couple months uh, I've been noticing a lot of inconsistencies in some of that stuff. So I, I thank you for coming in in front of us and trying to, you know, I, I seen the papers uh, that they put in the dash. Yeah or in uh, it's, um, very confusing. So going back to how do you obtain this, um, one of my biggest concerns, and I have had a conversation with, with Jeff Sylvester in regards to this, and, and, and a little bit, I think, with, with you, Sue, maybe, maybe with Marianne, uh, before was, um, I've seen commercial vehicles uh, using this, uh, and I'm not sure if they were real or not, but they had, um, they had the paper day and night, um, mm -hmm. and when I asked the police chief was, you know, is this allowed? Mm -hmm. um, and he said, no. So I gave him the photos. I'm sure he, he took care of that because I haven't seen a vehicle parking a municipal lot anymore. Uh, but the other tricky part of that is, um, and, and I also provided the-, the I remember the, we're not using any, we have no plates no, on it now. So, right. but, so the trick part is I have a vehicle, mm -hmm. regular plates, my, my standard car, mm -hmm. but I have a business. And, you know, they, some businesses like to wrap their cars with their logo, but they don't have a commercial plate. Mm -hmm. How do we handle that kind of situation? Um, they're, be, they're used for commercial purpose, right. but with a regular plate. Right. Be a visa. And that's the thing. Mm. So what, is, not, what does that mean? It doesn't have commercial plates. It's a personal yeah. vehicle. So it's, almost like, it's almost like a van yeah. without commercial plates can go on a parkway, right? right. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the tricky part. So. That is the tricky part, you know. But I think those are far, uh, far fewer than somebody just taking the cards and throw them in, on their truck or, well, or what have you. Swap their vehicles because I noticed that a couple of times mm -hmm. in some of the municipal. What, and, and I'm glad that you're addressing those. But to me, the biggest challenge, I guess, and and you said probably that would be step five, uh, is people abusing the system where they they get one of the uh, 24 hour tag right and they just literally park there 24 hours and they don't move the vehicles i think that's the biggest challenge that we have because now we give them permission to do that mm -hmm. um so i think that that is a, a sec uh, it might not be step five it might be step three of this whole thing but for right now i think what we have to do is we have to bring the whole system up to, to the 2000 20 i was gonna I, I was gonna say i was gonna say 2000 <laughs> so uh but uh i think what we have to do is we do have to get these new, we have to make it easier for our code enforcers and then we can the other thing is a much bigger picture and it goes with the meters and it goes with what is the whole parking plan which is a project that the, the assistant manager is doing so my last question i think is more related maybe to parking and because you guys have talked to parking enforcement and probably right. Kevin is, you know, we are going to be providing these tags. Right. Or hang. Um, and as, hopefully at some point we'll have the scanners do the job. Yeah. Um, you know, with, with the so we won't need any tags because. Well, that will be, we'll that would be. That stuff. That, right. Sure. But, you know, and maybe Stuart, you can help me with this. Right now we're not using the handhelds uh, to write the tickets, correct? That's correct. Okay, so because my, my other question was going to be if at some point we will be using mm -hmm. handhelds, um, you know, like right now 
they can scan your registration or your you mm -hmm. know, promotion and it gets all that information. Right. Um, you know, is there any way to protect ourselves to someone coming in? If, if there are people selling this kind of stuff and trying to make a duplicate of this. It's the, that's the hologram that we're going to be using. Uh, and it's very similar. The holograms that we're going to be using is very similar to what we're using on the taxi licenses. Okay. And that's what really started the conversation when we spent that Saturday uh, over at the courthouse doing the taxi licenses. It's, we're doing it in-house. It's a special hologram with the logo of the village on it. Um, we have been working with the police department because they, the, they, they were the ones that brought that whole taxi licensing thing in-house. In which was great. It's a big improvement. And um, so it will be much harder than what we have right now. So again, step one, it, it could change by the time we're at step three or four, the whole thing could be revised again. But at least we're giving, we're, we're being consistent with the people that need those parking spots. We're being consistent with us having, um, uh, being able to uh, offer that while we're looking at this bigger picture, but it's not worth leaving it as is. Okay. Um, so you're not asking as we're, as we're doing that project. So you right now you're not asking to change the fee schedule. No. Well, there is not, there is not currently a 24 hour fee. You just be you're just gonna make it a. Well, what we do is we combine. We we just add the two numbers together. And you did want to make a quarterly option. For all of the levels. I, I, we want to make it, we need to make it, well, we need to do this. We need to, we, we can't have on one, on night, it's six months or a year. And then on day, it's quarterly or a year. But yeah, go ahead. Um, so again, the code is silent on the quarterly, annual, six months, whatever. So that's something that can be contemplated with the fee schedule conversation. So we're not there yet either. But all of it, you're hoping that all of that is done by April 1st. No. No. No, the fee part. No. no, no the fee well, part. I mean. I just, but that's uh, what I, I don't understand. Designation. The fees you talk about the designation of the tax. Yeah, I mean, changing the fee schedule is, is, is much simpler than changing the code. It's something you simply vote. Yeah, yeah so I would, I would say that we, why wouldn't we change the fee schedule at the same time to have it be what makes sense with the new approach with the 24-hour and. I mean, it, it could be done however the, the board sees fit. I mean, the way that I was sort of looking at it and waiting to do any changes to the fee schedule was in case they wanted, or they, they being you, um, wanted to change the actual amounts for the parking passes, not just the periods of time for which you could buy them. I think we're going to take off enough people with the changes you're already recommending that I would suggest we keep the fees where they are and we create a quarterly one. For Plus, now. we had a, a rate increase at the beginning of 2020. Another good reason to just stick with the rates as we have, but, but make it consistent. But it is, a good, it is a good part of this whole parking thing to evaluate uh, different what different garages, are, what people's apartment houses are, are charging them to park in the garage and what different lots are charging. So that's where this all, this is where this discussion came from. I just, I just know that we have to have, as much as I'd love it to be every year, a fee every year, I know there's people that struggle to pay that $85 a quarter. Because they come in every, you know. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm sensitive to that. I don't, I'm, I, it doesn't seem like it's gonna change significantly our experience. It just means you have to collect checks more often. Yeah, so I think what we'd rather do is, um, and I and I can totally understand where they came with the six months in the even, in the night because it's only it's it's I shouldn't say only it's seventy dollar it's a much smaller amount right so uh, but uh, I think doing our first part then evaluating you know it could be that in a year from now these aren't even part of the fee schedule anymore that it's a totally different way of, of parking right. yeah, changing the fee schedule is. One resolution, one day. So let's just have the fee schedule make sense, and then it can be wildly different next year if we, that works. If we decide. Any to um, any cost to this changeover? So the the cost is limited, believe it or not, except for um, us building the files and uh, getting the files from the company. It seems to be a slightly a bit of a struggle, but we'll get it. Um, so it will be building the files. We'll be doing right now. We do the forms in we. We print the licenses in-house. It's 
something relatively easy. The police have showed us how to how they did the taxi licenses, so we'll be working off of that. Uh, so there's no um, cost except for the new tags, which again will look like this, and then the little hanger. There's a hanger, and so we're evaluating the different costs of the hangers right now. The go to go back to the paper that we're using, the special paper that we're using for the licenses uh, for the. Um, for the parking permits now, that's the same paper we, believe it or not, the same paper we use for licensing. So for their refreshment license and for their uh, cabaret license and stuff. So we have use for that paper. Um, we are still using the stationery and everything with labels on top of it. So we're very frugal. We are very frugal people. It'll be interesting to see um, if people aren't allowed to just move the pass from the husband's car to the wife's car or the roommate's car that if we end up having more applicants. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, and this is literally just for municipal parking lots. This is all we're working on. This is in this first phase is only muni parking lots. Uh, there's uh, many of them and you know they're all over the downtown area and then up on Highland Avenue and stuff. So it's only for muni parking lots right now. Madam Assistant Manager, Madam Clerk, thank you for bringing this to us. I think that it's great. Um, Sue, you in particular uh, spoke a lot when you ran for clerk about wanting to make these kind of changes. So I'm sure this is just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, my only question is about use cases. It sounds like maybe people who uh, work here or have businesses or so forth. My, who's using uh, these kinds of um, permits both day and night. Do you have a sense of that? So, yeah, so a lot of the day passes are used by the businesses um, and their employees. And uh, for instance, um, at uh, Neighbors Link, they have maybe 10 attorneys sitting up in that office, and that's where their attorneys reside, and they all have passes. Uh, our other major one is Open Door. Uh, they just bought to church, so they got their own parking lot. So uh, that will alleviate some of the parking in our parking lots a little bit too, which will be helpful for everyone. It doesn't. It sounds like a revenue loss, but it's really not. It's um, it's it's going to help everybody across the board. Um, there are residents that live down there that yes, park their car, and then they take they might take the train to work because you know as far as they they're concerned, living on Main Street is transit oriented uh, living. So uh, that's what it, and then again, part of the pricing issue that we were talking about is that uh, some of the apartments charge more to park in the parking lot than this whole tag for like a month. So it's a no-brainer. Um, so it, that's who it is. It's mostly workers and um, a lot of uh, people that live there, a lot of them buy night passes. And it, of course, that seems so logical, right, to, that they would buy a night pass. But that's who we see coming in. I had a question a little while ago, I think. Nope. I, uh, <laughs> I don't save you my lean questions. Forward I'm going to save my back. questions for when we have uh, a little further discussion when it gets into the other overnight parking. Yes. Okay. The hardship. Oh, yeah. The overnight yeah. hardship. Yeah. yeah. And I know we just want to remind I just want to remind our audience that the clerk's <laughs> office takes care of the uh, the commuter parking lot, which we are sold out. So, uh, you know, if you want to go on a waiting list, that's about what we have open right now. We have we take care of the muni parking, what we call the muni parking, which is a municipal parking lot, so what, which we were talking about tonight. And the hardship parking, which means that you don't fit in your driveway or you don't have a driveway and you're going to park on the roads and streets of the uh, of Austining, um, you go up to the finance office on the second floor, and they take care of that up there. So at this time, at this time yes. Um, and and as as we automate and make things easier for the people to be able to apply online and to get this other stuff, um, <laughs> that you know it will be a different story of taking over different things. Um, I went to clerk school and I realized that you know. Some clerks take care of all the finance, all the finance exchanges that happen in the community. So that doesn't open a door. That was not a door opener. The door's open. No, no, no. I, first, <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to thank you both. This is 
I don't know if I'm going to say exciting is the right word or overdue. <laughs> um, but I will we'll look forward to working with you. On yeah, this, this is it. It is. Um, yeah, like it. it's like exciting, the and there's exciting. and this Go is this it. is parking, and there's hey, and there's. Parking. But there's parking and there's all other sorts of um, fun things that we all have to look forward to. So, yeah. Well, yes. Okay. Did Adam, you need is this something? I want to give one more quick note about why it's wonderful that we're going to start doing this in-house. Um, the form that we set up is going to ask folks who come in to buy a tag for not only an email address but a phone number. Um, so we want to integrate that with what uh, Jamie Hoffman works on so that if we're going to be closing a parking lot, we can just grab that whole list and say, just so you know, tomorrow, Tuesday, March, whatever, this lot's going to be closed. So please, you know, be, be aware. Um, so we're really excited to try to gather, you know, a little bit more information about the folks that are taking the passes so we can communicate better with them. And they can get reminders that the tags well, and are then it, it opens up it opens up your constant contact list it opens up your communications you know um no emergency all kinds of things yeah exactly good stuff all righty so thank you very much the ask is that we would have a resolution next week to call for a public hearing to modify the code no no you can't do it. i have to have the code co i have to show you the code first so next week is the code. No, I would, you would not be prepared to do that. I would be prepared on the 26th to show you the proposed legislation. On, in the first week in March, you would call for the public hearing, which would be in the third week of March. And then you could theoretically vote when the, you close the public hearing to approve the local law at that time. Could we? I could not have it. That's why they're asking for April. Okay. Could you, could you um, have it in new business next week? Madam Clerk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking. I, I know I'm the one that says no. Okay. No. So the, the timing may have been my mistake, so I apologize no, no, for that. It's theoretically still doable, mm -hmm. but it can't be done in that particular order. So just, I think you're saying more like April, yes? I think that, again, next week, right, I got on the 26th, it. It gets it. presented to you folks in, in a work session. Right. You call for the public hearing at the first meeting in March. It would then the public hearing would be the second legislative meeting in March. You could vote to approve the local law at that meeting when the public hearing is closed. So theoretically, you could have it in place by April the first. We typically okay. do not like to correct. So if you don't, then you would be looking unless to it's vote truly April. very perfunctory. No, and then I will tell you that uh, I would prefer you give it the time that if you have people that want to comment on it and stuff. And it should be April the seventh. I will tell you, I will tell you we have, um, I will tell you that we have already told people that we would be making changes and that we are working. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, uh, we, we have, uh, yeah. uh, I will tell you that we, we have already started telling people that there will be changes to the um, uh, uni parking and, and they know who they are. So it's, it's like. It's a, it's their own little world, the Muni Parkers. All so, right. Thank you very, very much for having me here tonight. Thanks all. Thank you, Thanks Madam so. Clark. Thank you for livening up the evening and bringing us for this excitement. exciting and overdue. So I just want Thanks. I just I just want to say it's going on ten o'clock. We have a couple of short. I thought the last two might have been kind of short to items. Um, we, yeah, we usually we give did. ourselves like a, a five minute break. Do people need a break? I need a break. I could just walk away. You guys can keep talking, but. We should take a photo. All right, five minute break. Okay, then we'll come back. Madam. Um, yes, clerk manager, whatever. Uh, oh, did I call you a clerk again? <laughs> it's oh, okay. I'm so excited okay. to have the clerk here. I know that was a, a back, little, little bit of a highlight this evening talking Absolutely. about those parking changes. Thank, thank you also. Uh, Madam Assistant Village Manager, who um, is also up next to talk about um, the establishment of a capital budget, project and budget for our, um, this is part of our CFA, CFA grant to do the remediation for 200 Main Street. Um, so with that, um, Ms. Zahaj, can you uh, please give us the information on that? I sure can. Would you be so kind? I would be so kind. Um, hopefully, this should be the quickest conversation on the agenda tonight. Um, oh, so, 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, what I'm passing out to you now is actually something that uh, was not done by me. This is uh, what was originally submitted uh, with the CFA application as the grant for the 200 Main Street Rehabilitation Project. Um, in speaking with um, other folks in the manager's office and in the finance office, um, it came to my attention that we do not yet have a capital project open for this work. Um, so what I am asking tonight is for the board's okay to establish a capital project and budget at next week's meeting. Um, the only part that's a little up in the air has to do with the in-kind services. Uh, for purposes of the grant accounting, I'm talking with um, Tom and Dale. Um, you are giving me a look. Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the, um, about how to account for the in-kind services. Um, but the $467,300 is the award from the CFA program and the village's um, mandated 25% match is the $155,774. Um, there was a uh, resolution passed in July of 2019 committing this money, but a capital project wasn't established. And what is the definition of soft costs? Uh, soft costs would be like architecture and uh, design work. Um, that um, that is the entirety that. of the uh, of the. Yeah, use that all the time. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's it. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, I just wanted to give the board a heads up that that was coming. So this is just for a capital project, the op to, to, uh, to assign a capital project into this whole This thing. is just to open the capital project and set the budget so we can let New York State know that we've done so and that the board has formally committed the money um, outside of the July 2019 resolution. Yes. I'm sorry, Maddie, would you explain the $12,000? Sure. Um, the way that the grant was written is that the village um, would have the 25% cash match, which is all that's required. That's the one thousand or the one hundred fifty-five thousand dollar number. Um, the twelve thousand three hundred forty-one dollar um, is in-kind services, so presumably um, administration between our office um, and the village engineer. Um, I do have a copy of the application here, and I can read to you what was written. Um, okay, do you have any other questions while I'm looking for that? Sorry. No, I just I no, want to make sure I, I get so it right. I, I guess it, I guess it goes back to the to the grant portion, sure, because we do have an administrative portion in there which is five thousand five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So and then we have in kind, so we have two administrative costs for this particular grant. So um that's sort of like and then you we have was Sorry, I um, don't remember. I, I know we did the application. I know we reviewed the whole thing, but do we had, I'm assuming we had the interim as well as so part I, of this? So I can share the sheet with you as well. I don't have a copy for, for all the board members. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the no, details. No, I, I, I have it just yeah. here, so I'm just going to pass it on down to you, but I'll read it. Um, so it's accounting for um, staff members at, at three different hourly rates. Um, and then subtracting out the paid internship and $5,500 of the administration costs that are being taken care of by the New York State version. And that's, or uh, the New York State portion, excuse me. So that's how you get to the $12,341. So I'll pass that down to you to take a look. You know, um, one of the, the, the elements of this conversation that uh, was never resolved was um, not not the remediation part of it but then what are we planning to do with the building mm -hmm. we don't we still don't have to make that decision right we not we do we do not um, so um, we, we, we do don't not. always see an eye, eye on that one <laughs> we, <laughs> we've <laughs> had uh, we've had I so you know back and forth. we did talk in the grant in the CFA CFA and in the DRI about potential uses to this building and that was incorporated in this grant is that once we remediate it, it puts the village in a much better place to um, to uh, sell the, vill uh, the building to developers who would then do something that would spark economic development. So that is, a, you know, 
Oh, we can't just skip the build. Yes. Oh, and this, and thus, we're not staying until oh, midnight. So I just wanted to make sure we didn't have to figure that out before we establish the capital project. It's just basically creating a, a clean box for whatever the next step and is. For is the, going to be. the the future of that building, so it can be uh, put to good use in a context of of driving economic development in the village. And the use could be TBD, while without at the time that we open up the uh, the, the capital use. project the capital is just going to be called Two Hundred Main Street Rehabilitation. That's Perfect. it. Perfect. Yep. So uh, a thank you for catching this because it sounded to me in the first sentence of your discussion or presentation is that you realize that we have not done that. <coughs> thank you for that. Okay, short and sweet. Anybody else? Just as promised. Anybody else has anything? You get a gold star. <laughs> thank you. Take that. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Maddie. I was the only one we, we got in. We got a ride for that one. All right. Okay. Um, manager. What's next? Okay. Uh, oh, next. Yeah. Um, oh. Next on the agenda uh, was a discussion <laughs> wow, about the 2020 reimbursement talk. policy. I don't know. Um, uh, this is something that we had brought up. It was uh, at the reorganization meeting. It was um, uh, something that the, the board had asked to. Um, uh, give some thought to and um, it is something that we have to um, establish um, now that we're fully into 2020 so um, but it, I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, again that's uh, that's where we are right now I believe the board w had some thoughts on this and I'm not um, so we did we talked about it two weeks ago and Enrica circulated some written ideas just to the five mm -hmm. to the five of us Correct. <laughs> yesterday so really we should reflect that back to you so that they might be incorporated or we can have more of a conversation that we're all prepared to have so yesterday or last week so if um, I think that um, and uh, uh, Stuart you can correct me I think it would be great if we could get that input and then um, we can put this on for the next work session and um, with your input we can draft um, uh, some recommended uh, policy language and and hopefully resolve that um, mm -hmm. at the next work session great Sounds good. Well, that was the quickest one of the night there we go yes. all right <laughs> it's okay it, 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 it was just postponed it wasn't resolved it was just postponed and and our next our next two <laughs> items which should be equally uh, quick um, we we have a tax certiorari settlement, um, and um, I, I'm going to turn this over to our corporation council. Thank you, village manager. Folks, we have two uh, tax certiorari settlements. Uh, first involves Wells Fargo and the three parcels that they own on Pleasantville Road. Uh, they uh, and the tax cert would total uh, twenty-seven thousand two ninety-two seventy-six. Uh, and that's for tax years 2015 through 2020. Uh, the other one is with regard to Plateau Associates, uh, and that's uh, for tax years 2013 to 2019, and that totals 14,221.92. And that property is? That's where the Hidden Cove development will be. So those, those two are on. They are both consent judgments were signed, approved, and the village is uh, obligated to pay within uh, 60 days, otherwise interest has to be paid. Thank you for informing us. We have no choice. <laughs> we'll see it next week. Yes. It's always a nice exercise to feel like we could do something with that information. <laughs> We're just being kept in the loop and yeah. being told what our obligation is. Next, Good. we have the uh, uh, cabaret license for the Osning Elsk Lodge. Uh, that license has been, has been vetted by both the police department and the building department. Uh, the Elks Lodge is looking for a cabaret license uh, for, uh, for, for music to be played between 6 p.m. and midnight, uh, Monday through Sunday. Uh, they did have a cabaret license last year, uh, and they've come back again for another cabaret license for this year. And again, uh, no uh, objections from either police uh, or the building department. So uh, we would ask to be able to put a resolution before the board next week uh, approving the cabaret license for the Osning Elk Lodge. I would, I would gladly like to see it ne on next week, and um, I'm just taking note of the fact that it will be the last week of February next week, or the third week of February next week, um, and these are calendar um, permits, and so 
just as the clerk was talking about getting that contact information people and sending them reminders this seems like um, the majority of the cabaret license applications we've gotten have been since the new year began and so hopefully going forward people will be sort of reminded in October or whenever is the appropriate time to get their applications in so that they aren't don't have a lapsed cabaret and therefore operating without their cabaret license for the beginning of the year as I know may have happened but the license will be from January 1st or yes it's a calendar year it's a calendar year so the only the only there is a there is a provision with regard to the cabarets that if applied for I believe after June you pay for the half year right but, but in this case well late they're they're not it's not the same thing as with the tags I mean they're not get, getting as long as there's no complaints it's not an no, issue the problem is if, if anybody happens, complained when they didn't have a cabaret license right, then no. they would have had their right shut down. I mean just to point out that it was received in uh, December but uh, the uh, the the evaluations by the two departments didn't occur until January middle of January so, so that's why that okay. just raises another thing so Maddie you know um, to have databases where we can get information on constant contact I mean you could just create a list that says all the cabaret license they need to have emails they need to it just adds to the list when there's a snowstorm when there is a spill yep. when there's blah 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 that we should be able to do it and of course 60 days before the end of the year they should like get a little something that says on that list hey your cabaret license right. end of year blah, you know all that right. stuff so that but this just adds to our enriches our database by just adding yep. there which I don't think we've been doing actually have we I don't know it's a new day we're excited new day. We've talked about doing the same thing for the water bills so that we could put out things about water main breaks and that kind of stuff right. I think that I would, would be helpful also add that I think right. the uh, commuter passes what there's like 800 of them where is I think that's 800 yes that's what Marianne once no told idea. us yeah. 800 no no how many tags we we give out is 800 is what I believe Marianne once sent it doesn't matter if it's 600 or 700 800 are those names and their emails and contact info captured somewhere on the database so they too can be communicated to I think we Every really have to look um, I can't remember because I actually should know this because we just filled out one of those forms but to be honest I don't think that there are captured no. they're, not, I, I they're not I filled it out they're not so, so go, we yeah. have to like we're going we have to go back and New update vehicle, those forms and, and get that information it's all good yeah. I mean it could be done next year I'm just saying as these things come up it's all a great yeah. learning online yeah. applications yeah. And, mm. and worthwhile information yeah, it's yeah. all great. Huh? Online, online applications and contact so info. Well, well See, that I, is the direction we're going in. And then Edmonds will be very helpful in that regard, right? Yes. So the clerk's office Hopefully. might be different. Um, well, you know, event, you know, that is where everything's going. So we should be able to, you know, That's we're really Maddie's working doing. on trying to um, make sure we get there. So um, it is, uh, you know, and, 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 you know more and more people want to be communicated with they do tell me well I can't read all the emails that you sent me so then that makes it hard too but we'll be it's doing right. the airplanes and you know smoke signals and all kinds of stuff you know we'll be we, we have to uh, getting the car with the blow horn I don't know what else we're, we're gonna have to try a different a lot of different ways to communicate but um but uh, I think that getting that that information um, people do pay attention to that stuff and um, I, I will bring up our plans for social media as well as to better communicate too, but not tonight. Great, great. All right, thank you. Is there anything else that we weren't anticipating that's not on our work session agenda that we need to uh, talk about tonight? Not tonight. Okay. There was a, a request for executive session. Yes. For I can't remember what. I thought it was matters of person. The one I asked for is matters uh -huh. of personnel. It's also this thing with the. That was a person. That was what I asked. For. Okay. So, can we have a motion to uh, re uh, adjourn to executive session for matters of personnel related to specific persons? Second. So moved and second. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 And with that, we say thank you very much for joining us. Please come to the meeting next week at the Birds of Fagan Police Court facility uh, at our usual time, 7:30. This meeting is adjourned to executive session.